This is the Community and Economic Development Committee. I'm John Weddleton. Dick Drain. Pete Peterson. Are we Jan Watson. Sean Liddell. Mandy Arnst. Suzanne LeGrand. Bill Steyer. Dave Whitfield Planning. Brian Yell Planning. And Fred was here a second ago. Fred Dyson stepped out for you, sir. Okay, so we have one item. Chris, Chris, oh, Chris Thompson's on the phone. And Fred Dyson, Fred Dyson's there. there. So we have one application here. It's uh, for Tundra Jane. So, um, Mandy, do you want to go um, So this is Tundra Jane's cultivation license. Um, we've been here previously with their, their two. Um, so similarly, their operating plan for the cultivation application is similar, and it addresses all of the license restrictions and security requirements and the health and safety standards. Uh, there are no taxes to be applied to and there were no extra license conditions recommended. Sorry, did you say they've been here before? Yeah. Well, not exactly. Not exactly. Yeah. Well, Flying Y Investments right. has been here before with like the Holly Lee. Just wait on that because I have some questions related to that a little bit later. But, but a general for licensing. Okay, so we have ACF Ventures LLC doing business as Tundra Jane is applying for a special land use permit for a marijuana cultivation facility. It's going to occupy 4,057 square feet within the existing 7,500 square foot building. And this is in the I-1 district. Uh, the site is located near the northwest corner of the intersection of East 88th Avenue and Old Coast Parkway. Tundra Jane intends to operate the marijuana cultivation facility in conjunction with the retail sales and Manufacturing facility, facility operated by Aldi 907. So the marijuana retail sales establishment is AR 2017 353, and the marijuana manufacturing facility is 2000, AR 2017 377. They, those both currently have assembly approval. Uh, the petitioner has provided all the necessary applications of middle materials, and the planning department has found those to be in compliance with the applicable provisions of Title 21 and the 2040 land use plan. With that, the planning department recommends approval of the special land use permit subject to the conditions that are stated in the staff report. And the conditions were? They're, they're, the, they're the same here. I think that <coughs> there's, there's a slight obscure fence. Okay. Um, you got the locker? So we've we've had a lab, oh yeah, go ahead. Go ahead for all that. Um in the original paperwork you may have seen uh, the letter may have been a little confusing because we can't folks can't go square from probably nine or seven. So the letter initially had uh, had that identified as the applicant. Um, Janet can confirm, but it's my understanding those folks own the building, and uh, so therefore it was logical for them to come to us and clarify the paper trail. Yesterday we discussed with the planning staff a way forward. Um, our point of contact contacted theirs, confirmed that when they came in and made the application, gave us um, sizes of electrical load that they were including the projected load for Tundra Jane, and they confirmed that was true, and so they amended the letter and uh, emailed Sean a copy of it yesterday. So uh, sort of clearing up the paper trail, we believe, and as a point of fact, the uh, upgrade was completed in December. So their, uh, their upgrade was done. And I should say, that's my understanding if planning or anyone else has a different uh, understanding. Yeah. So now the fence, what, what is, there's no fence, yeah, that's what. There's the small fence currently there, but the side of steering the fence. Yeah, the lot of so can you spring. open and start planting plants now, or does you have to wait? Well, we're not built out all the way, or mid-construction. Um, but no, I, I think that's it. My understanding that the fence has to be in before we can start. Mm -hmm. That's the way I read it. So generally speaking, uh, all the conditions have to be met before they can start uh, the marijuana business, the cultivation in this case. So the fence would have to be in place before they can start the marijuana. So like that? May would be the early. We, we planned for that. Um, we knew that this was going to happen. Remember, we started this right. when it was green sales month, like six months ago. Yeah. Yeah. So we kind of staggered. August when they were the last time or something. 
That must be this, just the size of the lot. Yeah. Yeah. The building is obviously not 18,000 square foot. So. so I don't know that it's um, I don't know that it's an issue. I had um, emailed Dean about it just to clarify. Just to pass that like, that's Dean's email. Yeah. So you've got your because it was kind of jumped out. I was looking for Holly Mead, Holly Mead, which is fine. Kind of brand team, but also partners in some regard. So you own Sweet Low Studios, which is a 50 percent owner of ACF Ventures. And ACF Ventures is just the cultivation. Just right? the cultivation. And then the owners of Hollyweed are also 50 percent. Correct. So that's all fine, and that kind of thing goes on. And the only is so I was thinking, okay, well, suppose you sell half of Sweet Low. Okay. So now. You're not 100% owner, or not your 50% owner. At what point do they have to report to get approval of change in ownership? You, you don't, you know, it just gets a little every obscured. Yeah. For, for the state, every every single time. And my understanding too, for any change, mm -hmm. we come back to the Mandy's office right. and get a new marijuana license and disclose all the new owners. So a change in ownership within Sweet Loaf. Oh, well, yeah, absolutely. Has to be reported, yeah. and that was, but it would be very obscure. I mean, that could happen to this other. Is really sweet low on the documents is the owner. Sweetly. 50%. Sweet, sweetly, but. Sweetly. Um, yes, but the license, if we didn't report the change of ownership. That makes more sense now, sweetly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, if we didn't report the change of ownership to the state um, within 10 days of a change of ownership, that would be violating the regulations. So okay. they theoretically lose their license. And our similar thing yeah. says that. And that's what Dave confirmed. And I, I just, but just seeing. Mm -hmm. Not that anyone's doing anything wrong, but within your sweet leaf, you could have some changes in there. You know. Anyway, who would notice so much? But, but you have to report. We wouldn't notice, though. How would you know? Well, we would know with renewals because they have to submit okay. all that with renewals. So if the year was a change, <coughs> it would be a red flag if it hadn't been reported as a transfer. Okay. So is the process. So any entity that is an owner, even if it's not an individual, you have to get details on that, and that rule is really who owns, because you can stack these two and all come like this way. So, okay. Um, yeah, I was just, I kind of just triggered my work through it. Well, and, and what, what I hear is going on in other markets is there's mass consolidation going on, and uh, it's, it's the big successful companies buying up the smaller, not quite so successful companies. I don't know if people anticipated that or not, but I think that's kind of the way business has been going in America. Bigger seems to be better, and so that's, that seems to be the trend right now. Yeah, in other states, um, here, that haven't happened too much. Actually, I've heard of a few people like out in the Cancun that are smaller growers, basically older older people that are just like, a lot more work than I thought. I just want to sell it, and, and you know, more valuable now. Their property is more valuable. It's got life and tech and whatnot, and so they can sell that because they've been trying to and I think some of those have happened. Um, but yeah, I think as the market matures, we'll see some, some consolidation. Okay. So any other comments? Thoughts on it? Or we'll <coughs> to move it for you. Question for you. Oh, yeah, Chris, sorry. Yeah, in this case, uh, did we get the thick packet for this in our boxes? Because I don't recall seeing it. It's in there. Um, I was out of town, so I apologize. I wasn't there sooner, but it's, it's there. Okay, it was there yesterday morning. Gotcha, thanks. Looking at it, I think they had 56 yes votes in the county council meeting. And that was their vote. That's pretty good attendance. Well, you said. and we went twice to the community council. That's, that's the community, community council. We have a lot of people that show up. Is that have a loop? Yeah. Try to get up. Yeah, I'm way behind the power curve on all of this. Could 
securing the ownership uh, be a way of hiding a, a, a principal in the company that has a criminal record? So, in, for example, in liquor licenses, if you have a corporation that own, and somebody owns less than ten percent, they don't have to report it. Um, for the AK Corporation Commission, if there's an ownership under five percent for an LLC, it doesn't have to be on there. But for marijuana, none of that applies. Every single ownership interest and every financial interest that the direct or indirect interest, except for a landlord lease or consulting service agreement, um, has to be disclosed and the person has to have a federal background check and be on the license. So unless they're violating the regulations in line, sure. um, okay. no. Yes. When one license spread that came through a long time ago, <coughs> they must have had 60 or 80 people on there. They own one or two percent of it. So it listed their names, their addresses, and everything. It's the guy that happens to manage our parking uh, system downtown. Yeah, well, former assemblyman was on that list, as yeah, I recall. He was on there, too. <laughs> the who's who? Very former. <laughs> Anything else on this? No. Motion? I'll, I'll move to recommend that we recommend. I'll second it. Any opposition? Okay, so you know that. Right, since Tuesday, you come up. And uh, so we're just part of the assembly, but we'll, when it comes up, we'll recommend it. There's a statement we recommend an approval. We'll see how it goes. See you Tuesday. Yep. Yeah. We'll try to have one agenda this Tuesday, but we'll talk like <laughs> So just um, separate from that, now, so this <coughs> two weeks in a row, we've come to meet for one more license. I think we don't want to hold up that. But we like each other at 4 12 in the morning. That's fine, but it'd be nice to have two. So, if there's any planning issue that we can stack on with these or life or any way to consolidate, so we have two or something, two or more, those would be nice. Yeah. Of the so, John, you'd asked the question a few weeks back about if we had any other issues yeah. that we could bring up um, because we do have a, a wide agenda and, uh, and looking at some of the things that we're working through. Um, we're not quite there yet. We have some things obviously that we're working on, but we're not quite ready to present. Um, you know, uh, we're working on the screening setbacks. Uh, we're working on the ADU ordinance. Uh, we're working on a couple other uh, that you had one suggestion that you wanted to uh, uh, change in Title 21 with regard to driveways. Uh, so we're working on all that stuff, but we're not quite ready sure. uh, to bring it. But as soon as we are, we'll, we'll certainly bring it together. Well, I think string setbacks at ADU is probably going to be a work session. Yeah, four, four work sessions. ADU is going to be, believe me. Yeah, yeah the you know, things on the driveway, that, that'll go through planning and zoning, right? We're working on another one um, in the R2 districts uh, on height. Um, right now, uh, the R2 district has a maximum 30 foot height limitation, but it also has a not to exceed two and a half story mm -hmm. restriction. And so we're looking at how we can deal with that two and a half stories, whether we can uh, omit that and put other uh, some other provision in there to, uh, to dec decrease the, uh, the shading and bulk uh, that could occur in those districts. So uh, that might be a good one to bring to you guys. Uh, we're just, we're almost there. We're not, not quite there. I, I would think on some of those things, if it's more technical, this is a good form for sure. If it's broader, because like obviously stream setbacks and ADUs have yeah. too many interests that yeah. go to a work session. The, the R2 districts might be a good one to bring in because yeah. it is a little bit technical. Sure. It might be good to bring to you guys. Okay, okay anything else? Fred? Uh, maybe Thank you were just no ask, asking this question. Uh, it seemed to me to be efficient if we could you know, have more than one of these. It's, it's a 38 mile round trip and nearly two hours from hand. Maybe I had to do it by phone. Uh, and, and it always bothers me to see a whole bunch of municipal employees having to interrupt what I hope is far more productive work. And if there people are in this building, I would suggest we let them keep their work going, whatever they're doing in their office, and on the exception if we have a question, maybe call them. But I'm a newcomer here. So I think that's the point. We, you know, for one meeting, we're all coming in, and you know, it's just a lot of work for some, but we've pretty much been committed to the industry that we won't. Yep. Yeah, to hold me down the lane. Drive your feet to hold yeah. me back. Right. Yeah, hopefully that will right. slow down in the next year or two. 
Well, it has slowed down because we were getting three or four. So yeah. well, now it's down quite a lot. And then have you, from your perspective, are we moving fast enough for your clients? I think so. I think it's important to do a detailed review of these things, not just hand out like candy. Because okay. um, at one time the industry was concerned we were stone stonewalling and we want to make sure we're not doing that. No, I mean, I think, I think it's more off. The state is kind of moving on like snail's pace right now. Um, they lost one of their reviewers again. Um, and, yeah, and so now they're down to one one gal reviewing things, and she's training somebody at the same time. So I mean, we dismissed applications yesterday, and they told us we were sixty. Those applications are sixty six and sixty seven in line. And so there's that many, you know, in front of them. And last last meeting, you know, I usually have 10, 16 new applications on the on the life on the agenda. And last meeting, I had two or three. Um, so they're just really slow. I mean, I think we're doing fine here. I mean, I think our turnaround for review from the staff has been way quicker than it has been. Um, well, I think that you. might be slowing down a little bit because they're, uh, when I was at the municipal league conference in Juneau last week, I heard uh, mayors talking about, uh, it's on the ballot that they're gonna be limiting the number of licenses some that they're going to issue in some areas. Yeah, I think that's smart for some areas. I mean, this is a this still is a federally legal substance. You don't want it to the market to be so flooded that it's not valuable and people are throwing out, out half joints, you know, and then people are young kids are finding them. And, and I do, I just, I do think that's a that's a could be a risk, you know. And so I, I don't think there's anything wrong with being strategic or doing a minimum based system, you know, really betting betting these businesses. So. Can I get coffee? I know, I know it gets, I, and I know that's the, you know, the liquor licenses have, have created this, this issue where people are hesitant to get into that, but I don't see any reason why, you know, um, on Alaska needs to buy pot shops, you know. Right. Yeah, I don't think that's the government's job. Yeah. They don't want to make dumb business decisions. Right. <laughs> that's their own problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm glad to have that, and uh, Juno has, I'm exaggerating, <coughs> but 4,000. The cruise ship pulled in for almost 4,000 people down on Front Street. And there's 38 cheaper shops. You know, yeah, that's, that's, true. that's their business. Is that Chris with a comment? Yeah, you know, I was thinking about this whole thing earlier, and you know, the last couple of meetings we've had one license. I'm wondering if we get to a point where we take a meeting a month where we review licenses and streamline it so that we tackle that all at once. Then we either meet or not on other issues in the interim, but we're meeting every week and sometimes we're just one license. Seems like a lot of work. Right, I think I think that's a good point. Um, and one thing I noticed on this, I mean, she's already building out her growth. So she doesn't have a license or approval to do that. Well, she but, she's it, right? but she's confident enough to do it. Right. Be, yeah. So the industry seems like they're pretty good with stuff. Because if we said no, she well, so we we waited to pull all the building permits and start those until we got Hollywood and, and for the retail manufacturing to make sure the the, the daycare issue was going to be addressed adequately, and then we felt confident enough that you guys felt comfortable with our plan for this for the screening that this would be not too offensive. Yeah. Ready to start, Brian? I just think, Mr. Chair, it's just more of just uh, when we discuss stacking cases, um, somebody's got to get an expedited review or somebody's got to get a delayed review in order to make that happen. Um, we, you know, we have deadlines in pace for the administration to review all of the documents that we submit to their review. Um, that would be last Friday, and then you guys time this meeting so that it can be discussed uh, the first day prior to the attending meeting. So it, it is unfortunate that we have one item on the agenda, but if we were to stack cases, um, we would get in a situation where either somebody would be delayed or somebody would have to be expedited, um, which could result in some sort of unfair review. Okay. Yeah. I was looking in the Las Vegas paper, and they now have a sanctuary box at the airport. Oh, so if you bought marijuana and you don't want to go through security, you can drop it in the security box there. Yes, please. We might want to send a letter to the state and ask the state to take control of the airport. Are you going to come up with one? This is a green box there at the airport. 
so you could drop off whatever you couldn't take on the plane, and the police <coughs> and troopers would come and take it away. Yeah. It's something I think we might want to ask the state about since they control the airport. Because we're going to have people buying it. Seattle airport too. We're going to have people buying it here that can't. They have last minute commitments. I've got a high pocket. What do I do? Yeah. Post security. Yeah. Can't do it. Like so we can drop it off. Yeah, that would be a great idea. It's, it's definitely mm -hmm. going to that. Do they have coffee? No, but I know people. It makes people really uncomfortable if they have it on their person it's and good. then they're like, oh crap. You know, what am I going to do now? Because. I just think it would be good for this committee to, to look at that, maybe talk to our attorney and then send a letter on to the state and say, we think it would help the people in Alaska, because we're going to have people come in buying it, that what do I do now? I've got my pocket. Yeah, it must go in the trash can. Well, and I think also, well, that, yeah, it would go in the trash can, but do we really want it in the trash can? Yeah, and it would be good for the, you know, just from the federal optics of we're doing our part to make sure we're not crossing, you know, state lines. They can't take it back to Boise with them, you know. <laughs> Just an idea. Yeah, we should do that. Right? <coughs> I think it's true. Just as a point, uh, the Stevens International Airport does have a dedicated planning staff, so we could have uh, like planning managers and discuss that issue and send one of these as well. Can you just give them a call? Maybe they're not sure we'll do that great idea. Maybe it's already in the works. Yeah, it might be. Why don't you do that just report back? I mean, we don't have to try it. Let us know. I just saw that in the Vegas paper. I thought it was a good idea. We might want to do it here. I think it's a good idea. But I, I, I think I saw one of those in the Seattle airport when I was coming back to you there a couple of weeks ago. So. Anything else? Bay 
road there's a um, mortuary that cooks bodies out there where there's no building codes some neighbors are really interested in the wow. in barrow where the people have a cinelet toilets property values go up and down with which way the wind blows <laughs> So what? So the process, someone is just it's out of your hand. The code of court yes. the call and they go out there. And so if they go out there and they say, yeah, I do smell pot for plants or whatever. I mean, mm -hmm. what, then what do they do? They give us a um, violation that is like, it looks like a little mini lawsuit complaint. It'll be to move the violation by yeah. alcohol. Yeah, well, like, I mean, for the state, that's what it is. But for, I mean, I've done several, and I had to do a several administrating hearings about this issue for clients yeah. no they just give us a complaint yeah. you know and then they send it to the administrative hearing office and then we have to you know pop up smell for a few hours no not with not, not with most violations no, the code, get, from the code of person ever by a noise a nose ranger electronic device we talked about it two years ago them that art of they could the machine could sense it have we did we get any of those or just uh, it's just uh, <coughs> perception and of the inspector whether they smell or not. Um, the nasal arranger, yeah, I know we didn't discuss that. Yeah, we talked about it. Yeah. Yeah. It just would be nice to have a standard because some people have, you know, way better smell than other people. And with the wind and like, you know, take, take Great Northern, Danish Gardens, and then there's an alleged illegal grow around there too. So these three situations get smell complaints all the time, but like, whose smell is it? Is it the legal operator? Is it yeah. the two legal operators? Like, what is going on? Um, it's just so hard to tell, you know? And it just seems like a waste of everybody's resources to be like, well, what direction was the wind coming from forever? And if we could have like a smell machine, I don't know how accurate those are, but, or some kind of reasonable standards. If we're talking about, yeah. If we're in the industrial section, I mean, I understand P3, this is not like a discussion we have. It's, it should be zero. But even with a smell machine, and your issue of where it's coming from, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't, yeah. It's not going to help. I think a reasonableness standard, like, you know, if it's happening all the time or it's like incredibly persuasive or something. Or, your doors open. Yeah, have your doors open or you can dumb things. Yeah. yeah. But I don't know. So this is an issue that's always kind of concerned me. And back in the day, I put it in municipal ordinance that if you're selling a piece of property, it has to be on the deed that it's in a floodplain or an avalanche chute. Because my reasoning was that those are kind of things that the average citizen is not prepared mm -hmm. to think ahead about, and particularly when it's city folks moving out to the fringes. And, uh, so I, I have the same kind of feeling of, of, about zoning. It's our return. When you're going to buy a, and we're going to get last there, a piece of property, you ought to be able to assume that the zoning is going to stay in force for some period of time. So if it's a zone in which uh, grows, you know, are, are possible, are permitted, and so on and so forth, the buyer ought to beware, know that, yeah, by gosh, somebody could have a dog lot or a marijuana grow in that section, and I got no recourse because they knew it ahead of time. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and that guy there that made his building plan or his business plan and stuff, you know, ought to be confident that nobody's going to mess that up. Anyways, so that's a principle I've kind of worked on. It's a good one got to be valid on some level and I don't know if it will apply here but the neighbor who's complaining you know with this marijuana stuff all being pretty new that's kind of a, a new wild card thrown into the deal well I would think that if someone decided well this marijuana smell is too pervasive for me so I'm going to sell this property and then they don't disclose that to the buyer the seller actually just broke the law. No, I'm not mistaken. Well, I, mean, I think they're required to disclose, right? I think they're required to disclose what the zoning is. I don't think they're required to disclose right. what the uses surrounding it are. 
but you I know, we, if I can, we had a woman come and complain from a bakery in Spinard who was like a mile from the nearest actual store. And so neighbors do complain, and we have to figure out how to be specific about these issues because it's easy for someone to make a complaint, you know, and it's irrational, but we, we take it seriously, and then we have to find out if there's evidence or not. So an evidentiary standard would be wise. Yeah, thank you, Chris. And I would just, you know, the, the, the client of mine that keeps having these issues, um, you know, with Danish Gardens, and the, he came up and he spoke to you guys at the assembly that one night. And, you know, I've had, I've gotten on procedural arguments the, the complaint dismissed twice. And then the third time they, you know, Elaine and Rich said, hey, are you at your facility? We're gonna hand deliver this complaint to you so there's no procedural issues with all the blah. But um, I mean, some of those, com one of the notices came after they got broken into, like a day after or something like that, where their, you know, their door was slashed open with, a, with an ax. And so it's kind of like, come on guys, like realize the circumstances that were going on around some of that stuff. Um, so that's kind of the issue. It's like they put in like $25,000 worth of additional smell controls right after the fact, and it's still an issue. So we've got to kind of figure out like, how do we let these businesses work, you know? Um, that may not be true, but what we have seen routinely is there's a section in the state thing, odor control, and this is from the one we just uh, looked at. Uh, mechanical units will provide negative pressure, create exhaust system, which will flow through a carbon filter process. The system will run throughout the entire cultivation area to eliminate detectable outside odor. This is kind of boilerplate, I know from you. Yeah, that's so fine. That's everyone fine. we hear have read is there will be no odor outside, so it's a non issue. But now we're going, well, yeah. maybe not quite right. I, yeah, and I, I think, I don't think anybody, any of these operators have run a warehouse before filled with marijuana. I think that they had their personal grows, that was their experience, and then they got into this industry, and so there's a lot of things that we're learning that it's not as easy to control the smell. Okay. It could be Kaladi Brothers that cooks their their coffee beans, because once they're cooked on those, I can smell it, I live three miles away. It's more crusade is the reason that marijuana is. Yeah. So who knows what they're smelling? I don't know. You can smell it driving down the Seward Highway, uh, <laughs> even in the wintertime, at least I can. They're cooking, they're cooking yeah. those oh, when they're cooking the coffee beans? Yeah. yeah. So based on what they're telling us, though, they need to up their game to put more filters oh. on there. I mean, that's because everything we've done said there will be no order. So it's really a lot of you. I know, but I want my clients to be healthy and successful. That's my, my end goal. Did, did they ever figure out who broke in? No. I mean, we have our suspicions, but um, the police have not. Former, former employee. If that's our suspicions. Um, I mean, they seem to know right exactly where to go. Um, but again, they could have found that in the state website and stuff like that. So. Okay. Anything else? I, I would, that we, reminded me. We, you know, we uh, um, we we changed the regulations so that we're we're not showing on the drawings where the cameras exactly are, <laughs> and. Um, uh, at, at AML last week, we were talking about, and I mentioned that we had done that, and so one of the assembly members from Fairbanks wanted me to email her the changes that we made because she thought that was a fantastic idea, yeah. and so they they will probably be introducing a similar measure uh, in Fairbanks relatively shortly. Okay. 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 Okay.